to everybody. So thank you. At Croeso Bau Borda, welcome. Uh, this is the final event of the Wizard Summer Series and launch of Amchwil Mido Cymru Migration Research Wales, which Rhys David Jones and Catherine Edwards at Aberystwyth University have put together. And really it's just a fantastic initiative by them to bring us all together um, and create a space for debates and questions around citizenship, migration and Wales. Um, if you're interested in joining this network, please do send a message either in the private chat or via email to Rhys David Jones. Um, he's collecting the names whilst Catherine is on uh, maternity leave. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so you have consented to that. However, it is primarily a recording of Gwen Nan and, and her talk. Um, but just so that you are aware of that, and the uh, lecture will be made available on the Wizard website only. So that's the only place where it's going to be shared. Um, Gwen Nan will be talking for around 45 minutes, and we'll have up to 30 minutes for questions. Um, my name's Angharad Kloss Stevens. I'm senior lecturer in the geography department at Swansea University, and it really is my great pleasure to introduce Gwenan as a colleague of mine at Swansea um, and senior lecturer in the Welsh department. And I think she's a perfect choice for launching this network today. Um, and that is for two reasons. Um, first of all, her work and her book, which was published in 2020, is driven by this question of what it might mean to develop an inclusive Welsh citizenship. And uh, now that's an important question at any time, but in the context of rising nationalisms and uh, the exclusionary nature of British citizenship, such as we've seen in the Windrush scandal and so on, it's also an urgent and necessary task. And the second reason she's a perfect choice is because her work is inherently interdisciplinary as well. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary researcher and teacher and her work on Welsh language pr provision for migrants in Wales has really drawn the interest of geographers, sociologists, po political theorists and linguists. Um, and really citizenship as a topic more broadly does allow us all to talk across disciplines um, so that's very useful too for this network. Uh, Gwen Ann joined the Welsh Department as lecturer in 2016, was promoted to senior lecturer in 2020, and in that year she was also awarded the Learn Society of Wales Dilwyn Medal in recognition of excellence in early career research. Um, so that's my introduction, Gwen Ann. Nigin Edrich and Mlan of Aur am to Darlifti. And as I mentioned, you'll be talking for around 45 minutes. Edrich and Aur, I'm Harad. So I've attempted to share my screen. Has that worked? Uh, yeah, sorry. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, Domani, Diochavaurian, Yang Harad, and the Krausa, Kanes, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm genuinely honoured to be speaking as part of this launch of this very exciting network, which I very much hope I can be part of and collaborate with people, not just in academia, but um, yeah, outside, across people working in um, third sector education and so forth. Um, and so to my talk, um, it is somewhat of a grand title and after giving a summary, I realised it was quite ambitious to <laughs> talk generally about international migration in Wales. Um, and I know many here will maybe be in a better place um, to, to talk about certain aspects. And I will be uh, focusing particularly on um, the idea of welcoming migrants um, the idea of, well, my maybe new interest in the idea of hospitality 
um, within the current UK framework. And of course, my particular um, research interest, which looks at the role of, of language. Um, so uh, just to give you a brief outline, um, the themes I will discuss, at least will be my take on migration in Wales, looking at the UK and the Welsh perspective, uh, and then finally focusing on some aspects such as language, belonging and citizenship. So where do I start? Well, um, yeah, migration in Wales, um, there's many things you can say about it. I think you might just start with <laughs> uh, thinking about the word. And I know if you translate it to Welsh, uh, it has different connotation. And certainly, in, depending on where you live in Wales, the word Mount Vidur, Mount Vidur, or Mount Vidur, which is migration, uh, you automatically think of a certain groups of people. And it's not, <laughs> it's not necessarily the, the focus of my research. But often uh, people would think of um, people migrating from large cities in England to uh, have a more perhaps uh, <laughs> quiet life away from the city in, in Wales. Um, or maybe as is very much a <laughs> debated topic in the press at the moment, the idea of second homes uh, purchased many from uh, outside of Wales. Um, so it is a very, um, increasingly debated topic, um, but also international migration in the context of the UK, everything that's been happening, uh, yeah, over the <laughs> course of the, well, last years, uh, namely Brexit, uh, it's been increasingly a matter of interest. Um, that concerns Wales, even though, of course, migration is not a devolved matter per se, um, but there is, a certain attempt to own <laughs> what migration in Wales or to at least to um, to consider these issues more and more. Um, so I did attempt to think like how how do I illustrate the state of migration <laughs> and I realized I yeah it, statistics fall far short and I did have an attempt at gathering some statistics um, and realized actually there's more gaps than there are answers and we don't know how many people from outside the UK are currently living in Wales. Obviously, it's very fluid. People come and go. Uh, there are certain statistics. Um, some are outdated and will hopefully fill a gap with the new census data. Um, yeah, seeming at the moment, 6.4% of the population um, are from outside or born from outside the UK. Um, then there's other statistics, certainly, for example, asylum seekers, roughly 3,000 asylum seekers currently um, provided into Section 95. Yet, of course, like, what about after that? What about refugees? What about third country nationals? And obviously, it's very much in a state of flux at the moment. Um, so it is fragmented. Um, but I think some of the key points to note is that migration is, despite what we're hearing now and what may happen in the future, has doubled in the last decade. Um, certainly international migration is more than um, from inside the EU. Um, I think an interesting point to note is that Wales future population does depend on migration, um, both internal and external due to stagnant birth population growth without it. More importantly for me and my research standpoint is what does, what does migration um, mean to us as Welsh citizens and, and what can it, it helps us to think more broadly about what kind of Wales do we want in the future. Um, I think it brings us more to the idea of people, which I'm interested in, <laughs> taking some of these photos from a project um, the European project on uh, laws during refugee week uh, on a thousand refugees lives um, and I'm interested in shining a light on in individual stories exposing truths that we don't see in the statistics obviously um, and maybe it's a, <laughs> it's a chance just to mention that I've, I did a little experimental project <laughs> of my own and created a video of uh, yeah certain voices refugee voices that I will show hopefully if it works <laughs> during during the session today 
Before that, though, I'd just like to reflect on some of the contrasting narratives on welcoming migrants um, between devolved governments and the British state government, namely Wales, of course. Obviously, this is no surprise um, to hear, I'm sure, but it's interesting just to track some of the increasing divergences. Um, on the one hand, obviously, the British government with the power um, over dispersing certainly refugees, asylum seekers, um, and having impact on big decisions, of course, whether they stay, whether they go, uh, if they can work, etc. cetera. Um, the Welsh government, nevertheless, having um, powers of education and cohesion, which increasingly is um, been shown as a way of um, telling migrants that, you know, there are possibilities that outside of the UK's power. Um, I think it's interesting to see increasingly bold statements from the Welsh government. I've just noted this one here. Uh, uh, well, Wales position paper on migration, stating really uh, gov Welsh government's lack of faith in the UK's migration system, particularly in how it concerns Wales. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that later on, I think. Um, so I just included a slide here showing some of the developing narratives on immigration integration from the UK standpoint. On one look, it does seem that uh, the narrative has changed drastically from multiculturalism, which was introduced from the 70s, derived originally from Canada, and based on minority rights, um, which nevertheless uh, was criticized uh, with increasing terrorist attacks and race riots, namely uh, from 2001 onwards, the approach from UK government was, was um, yeah, um, turning their back on multiculturalism and um, focusing more on the idea of integration, community cohesion, introduced by uh, Blair's Labour government, and new energy directed towards English, English language as a a bind between communities and the need to integrate through one uh, main language. Uh, so this has continued, but has been uh, taken on even further by um, conservative government, namely Theresa May's legacy of the hostile environment, which now <laughs> may be a hostile environment plus uh, it, taken over by Priti Patel. Um, yeah who is obviously we've heard much about the talk of criminalizing migrants. Um, so this backdrop of hostility. Um, so there's many things I could say about this and there obviously it's a lot in the news at the moment, the new borders, nationality and borders bill. And many of you who maybe work with migrants or research in this uh, area will be very aware that there are many things that this new legislation does not address. And obviously the main thing is it doesn't deal with the most pressing issues uh, is the inefficiency of what is going on in the Home Office. Demonstrated here in one graph, showing the increasing waiting time for asylum claims. Um, and also one point to note is that despite the, the emphasis on influx of migration in numbers, have not particularly high as portrayed by the Home Office. So what I want to just say here, I'm not going to go into much detail, uh, but despite attempts um, to create a hostile environment, it doesn't work in terms of deterring an authorised migration, and that has been proved. And it does seem the Home Office is aware of that, but what it does is uh, trap migrants. Uh, within the system um, and as we noted here it traumatizes them um, and, and doesn't help them integrate <laughs> um, and deliberately and permanently disadvantage makes them disadvantaged and this bill that has been introduced is only going to worsen the current asylum system just a point then on multiculturalism which well preceded all of this um, the focus, I mean, there, there certainly, from Bayrisha's point of view, were gaps in multiculturalism focusing just on racial equality and not linguistic equality. 
and many um, political theorists, such as Kimlicka, and in the UK, Madhu Demir have highlighted um, some of the problems with multiculturalism and have not really been implemented fully in the UK context. Um, but even then, uh, despite this seemingly um, seem narrative of openness and uh, acceptance of others, um, there's always an assimilative discriminatory undertone. And I think the Windrush scandal has shown light on this situation. Um, and obviously today the key words are interculturalism, cohesion, integration. Um, but yeah, what, what are the words in of, of themselves is the question. In terms of language, um, you know, many, even in the English context, and one particular uh, researcher has done excellent work on this, Anne-Marie Portia, who highlights the fact that um, although, of course, English is a useful tool, the way that language integration has been linked to government policy is constantly linking the problem of integration English-free homes. This obviously resonates even more, perhaps, in the Welsh context. And also from our own prime minister, um, we do see uh, narratives of, well, which date really back to the Victorian era of a language and assimilation. Uh, one nation, one language, or as we more recently have seen, one Britain, one nation. Um, so this supposed lang language of universality uh, actually propagates a specific hegemonic culture um, as Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, says, it is a particularism masquerading as universal. Um, yeah, I didn't refer to the quote here, but Boris Johnson says, I want everyone to hear to feel British, the most important thing to learn English. And there are places where English is not spoken by some people, and that needs to be changed. Um, closer to home, Professor Daniel Williams has commented that the monolingual form of multilingualism, multiculturalism, sorry, um, is rooted in the belief that the English language is the only legitimate bearer of all civic democratic nationality. Um, so I'm just going to turn my focus uh, to Wales a bit now and think about some of the issues regarding integration and migration. Um, yeah, and it seems in uh, some cases, the discussion um, is becoming <laughs> more divergent and more polarised. And um, you could say maybe football has something to do with it. And also COVID regulations have shown some of the increasing differences between devolved governments. Um, and one of my questions and in my research has been looking into this. And <laughs> I just put this in. Uh, as an example, famously um, in the 19th century, uh, the in entry in the index for um, the encyc encyclopedia for the index for, sorry, entry for Wales, noted Wales, for Wales to England. Um, and my research has sort of focused on some of the differences and also some of the commonalities between language and migration across, across these contexts. Um, so I will refer now to some, some of my research data. Uh, these are some of the research groups that I looked at. Um, the, you know, a series of interviews, focus groups with um, officers in Card Council, also in North Wales, Gwynedd, the Welsh government, uh, then specifically looking at the idea of language and integration, interviews with uh, Welsh teachers, ESOL teachers, and then finally, um, did some, uh, yeah, action research with, with international migrants, East Law students particularly, and looking at uh, the idea of learning Welsh. Um, so yeah, just thinking about what I said before, um, and what was clearly communicated to me during my research study um, was that Welsh government uh, ideas on integration were directly from the UK government. Uh, and it, obviously this interview here does state this, um, the definition of community cohesion has been taken from the UK government uh, following the 2001 riots in the North of England. 
Uh, so the principles are the same, and it's actually a way of bringing people together around British values. Um, this is one example, but the kind of idea I was that came across in many of the interviews uh, concerning language, this was also the same. Well, here I've actually got um, an extract from interview from an ESOL teacher, but also the Welsh Government ESOL policy, which was launched in 2014, um, which also took the view that obviously the English language is primarily the important, but by doing that looks look well, as you can see from the quote, the idea with other uh, languages, namely Welsh, um, would be problematic for uh, newcomers to Wales because English is already alien. Uh, this is also this was also reflected in interviews I had with ESOL teachers, um, saying that they've got enough trouble learning English and their Welsh won't won't do anything, won't help them. And even discussion discussion about uh, USOL or Welsh speakers of other languages um, provision um, was not considered by the government or anybody else uh, because the assumption is, you know, if you can't speak English well, Welsh is actually going to be more confusing. Um, so I found these viewpoints very interesting and I obviously contrasted this with, with my other findings, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but just to summarise here a few points, looking at the idea of integration or Multiculturalism, as I like to refer to, has been reliant on UK definitions. Um, and specifically when it comes to language, uh, there has been a, a shying away from defining any other language, particularly Welsh, um, and its role in diversity. And also more than that, many academics have labelled Welshness as ethnocentric, so it's it's been considered a very problematic issue uh, for thinking about the future future of of uh, of Wales. Um, so I think things have changed. I'm just saying this, um, and why I've quoted a few examples. Um, and I'm thinking in terms of government policy, but even uh, in other sectors, maybe in the education sector as well. Um, and I, I think, yeah, Brexit, the refugee crisis have had an impact on people and on making them think about who they are, I think. And I think in some ways, I think that's been useful. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is the decline of the Welsh language uh, for some in the last census was somewhat of a shock and the realisation that the future of its community is dependent on new speakers. Um, and certainly in my particular research case, that is interesting. Um, and the focus on opening the language to new groups um, is something that I've looked into. But it, I've seen changes in policy, talking about that last ESOL um, policy. There has been an updated version since then, and you can see a clear change in tone, uh, whereas Wales was, Welsh was disregarded in many cases, there's now recognition that there are two languages which are very important uh, and that the language can be a valuable skill, support, integration, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the other thing is the um, Welsh Government's um, strategy to reach a million Welsh speakers by 2050 um, and there is increasing attention there towards new speakers um, and making it possible for them to be part of, uh, yeah, Welsh language society um, through different programmes. Um, but I think the most significant uh, strategy is, yeah, clearly uh, Welsh government's commitment to make Wales a nation of sanctuary, which targets refugees and asylum seekers in particular. Um, I have to say, was somewhat sceptical at first. I mean, it is a bold statement. And having been, <laughs> well, through my husband, who's a, a refugee, subject to the hostile environment policies, at a time where he didn't have his answer, I really felt sort of, <laughs> what difference does this make? Um, and also, is it up to Wales to, to make that statement 
is it just a case of uh, upholding the established myth of Wales as a tolerant and welcoming nation? Uh, you know, is it that is it to them to decide? And should we not consult with <laughs> those who are affected by these policies, first of all? Um, and at the same time, sorry, this is my blank screen. I did mean to find a picture and I couldn't think of anything. So it ended up as a black screen. Um, I have been questioning my own practices. Uh, I guess in light of increasing attention towards, uh, well, history of colonization and focus now on decolonization and also Black Lives Matter and thinking about my own privileged, privileged position, who am I to comment to critique policies, pedagogies that affect others who are marginalized or colonized. Um, and yeah, I do wonder to myself, and I, I guess I'm in a process of learning. Um, I do uh, refer to someone who I respect very much, Professor Alison Phipps in University of Glasgow, who uh, is very much a voice on this matter and comments that there's many judgments that can be made on what you do with your role, um, but that we are all part of it, part of the problem, and you can do many things. You can own it, you can use it, you can pass it on to other people, as she comments on leaning in to people's experiences and then learning. Um, and so I, this, this is where I would like to go, and I, I don't claim that I have succeeded, but, um, in this attempt, and it has many flaws, I have attempted to create a, a brief, well, I say brief is actually seven minutes, a, a video of refugees' experiences in Wales. Um, and it might also just be a break from listening to me for a bit. Um, and yeah, I, I wanted just to hear that what they had to say about living in Wales, their experience of integrating or not. Uh, in the UK context. Um, it is very much an ongoing piece, uh, which for, for today is more or less cobbled together. Uh, I, I do realize that even in this process, um, I have made decisions myself regarding editing, creating, which in some ways I feel should be in their own hands. Uh, and that's something I would like to improve on in the future. Um, but for now, uh, here are, five voices of refugees in, in South Wales in particular um, on various subjects concerning living in Wales and integrating and, and belonging. So I hope everybody will be able to hear and see. I know and the current SCR Sakhti. چهل سال هم بوده اومدم اینجا الان حس 18 سالگی رو دارم میکنم و حس میکنم چقدر عقب اومدم خیلی کارهای راحتی رو که قبلا میتونسته انجام بدی الان برات سخت و دشوار when i came over here i don't wanted to i didn't want people to look at me as a useless person it's like a newborn baby without 34 uh, year experience of living وقتی که وارد بودگاه هیترو شدم ساعت ها مصاحبه با من کردن من خسته بودم توی راهی که پر از استرس اومده بودم به اختیار خودم نبوده اصلا نمیدونستم به جای امنی میرسم حالا چه اتفاق توی این مسیر برای من میفته اوایل که اومدم خب شاید به خاطر بحث مهاجرت هم بود هیچ حس تعلق خاطری من نداشتم به کل 
بریتانیا و الان خصوص ویلز چون بالاخره تجربیات اولی هم خیلی بد بود تنها بودم استرس داشتم نمیدونستم زندگیم چی میشه Everything is new to you So who should help you? I'm good at IT I know how to do some researches I know how to find these things out but lots of immigrants doesn't know these things doesn't know how to find out how should I live here how should I Uh, what is my rights here? What rights do I have? When we are looking for something about the government or we want to do something with the website of .gov.uk Just like, where, where, where do you live? I live in Wales, that's it, okay That's a Welsh language and that's an English language, that's it There isn't any different rules of it You can find something special, okay, you live in Wales Okay, we, you can do this, you can do it, no, nothing خیلی فرق دارد نظر فرهنگی به نظر من ویلزی ها با انگلندی ها و اسکاتلندی ها فرق دارد Well, and I started a clue uh, when I saw the pandemic Well, um, my wedding part on um, Anolf TV uh, Achos Rosdra TV Uh, Arroz Carpe, a Ben Vehin. Um, Ronin Trio, um, Kaduan Brasir, Kada Pesai, uh, and Grad Kada Kamrai, at uh, Roy's Ride Divisions, Tusky, a Ben Vehin. Ronamoya Dorosi, Astarach, Hamza, Ono, Horan, Nemish. Chun Tumor Marzida Shamay, Mepdor. از لحاظ بدنی مشکل دارم این باعث شد که اعتماد به نفسم پایین بیاد و از دست بدم زبان بلد نیستم نمیتونم ارتباط برقرار کنم و به عنوان یه بیگانه شناخته میشم اولین مشکلی که داشتم زبان یاد گرفتن بود که باید زودتر ایمپروبش میکردم و یاد بگیرم اول از همه حرف بزنم و ارتباط برقرار کنم چلنج این که بخوام با مردم با فرهنگ این مردم زندگی توی توی کلن پرسه کالج اینجا احساس میکنم زیاد نمیشه پیشرفت کرد یعنی خیلی پیشرفتش آروم آرومه و این کووید شرط خیلی بدتر کرد I got a lot of knowledge from other people but persons you know it's not from a Uh, and an organization who will help us it was people who helped us there was a, a welsh course about welsh language as well and they really did liked us it's not like because of their job no they liked us from their heart it's not like they acting no they really did از اوقات فکر میکنم میگم نمایشی جزء فرهنگشونه واقعا مهربونن ذهنمو درگیر میکنه که کدومشونه به کسایی که نباید پناه ببری و نزدیک بشی به خاطر تنهایی مجبور میشی نزدیک بشی و آسیب میبینی اون صد درصد اون حسی که توی کشورم با مردم کشورم داشتم اینجا نداشتم و فکرم نکنم اون سر بتونم پیدا بود تلاش میکنم که بیشتر جزی جامعه بشم جزی مردم بشم حتی حالا امروز گواهینامه میگرفتم گواهینامه هم قبول شدم این حس خیلی خوبیه دو این تملا فرمودین Kvrani at Bowit at Bowit Kamdesa Sol. Of course, well, I love Kamdesa Seriais, Sin Helpig Dariais, and Duedical Shais Maur. Of course, my people and Guerf Paurogi, best Duedi Gunet Dariais, best in Gunet Akvariais. If I want to say something which pushes me to leaving Cardiff 
there is just one thing which can push me that it is uh, the high highest salaries of course are much more than here شاید تا قبل از اون من خیلی به مهاجرت یا موف کردن از کاردیف شاید به یه شهر دیگه خیلی فکر میکردم احساس کنم اینا همه از همون حس حسی که یواش یواش توی من به وجود اومده همون حس تعلق خاطره تا قبلش نبود نه اصلا ولی الان چرا من احساس تعلق خاطر هم به کاردیف دارم هم به وز دارم اوکی okay. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I hope everyone's still with me. Uh, it was a bit of a long video, but even then I felt like uh, it's quite fragmented and I wasn't able to portray many of the things that were said to me. And I imagine different points strike different people differently. Um, obviously, I haven't had much time to reflect on <laughs> or analyze, um, but I do believe the emphasis on people for me, people as power, whether it is in a way that includes or includes individuals um, comes across here, but also um, the stated or unstated power of language or languages by using it um, or learning. Um, and even this, in this video, other languages or other new languages as a means to voice, to befriend, to deal with trauma uh, and maybe to contribute meaningfully um, these are some of the themes I've identified, um, focusing possibly more on, on social connections and, and language. Uh, I think it is interesting that the Welsh Government recently have uh, published a, a report on connected communities and, and, and identifying the link between loneliness, isolation and lack of social connections. And interestingly also language, not just English language, um, so for the sake of this presentation, the rest of it, uh, I will focus on, on, on the role of language, particularly, and the role of the host community and the possibility um, of hospitality, uh, which is of increasing interest to me. And it has been widely <laughs> discussed by many theorists and philosophers, even uh, dating back to Immanuel Kant, who propagated the power of hospitality as a right in and of itself. And has been taken forth by others, um, such as Ben Habib, more recently on uh, hospitality as a right to all human beings. And I think it is interesting because it really turns the idea of integration upside down, um, where integration, as it is interpreted, uh, certainly most commonly, is that the work it implies the work is is done mostly by the migrants. Um, and of course, in anything in this term, there is more responsibility here on the host community as the ones who have um, more power and, and the key to resources, possibilities, etc. Um, and I think without saying too much about this matter, uh, it, it has been expanded to what has been called linguistic hospitality, namely by Paul uh, Ricoeur in his area of translation, but it's all, also um, been discussed more widely um, uh, in, in more general contexts, uh, such as how the host community must try and take responsibility. Um, what has been called they must exile themselves, or, or rather that means they, there is a responsibility that they understand the experiences of migration or persecution um, with the aid of language communication. Um, there are many questions about how this is done. What are the what are the dangers of this? Uh, I could, at this point, refer to an excellent case in Scotland, uh, the work of Dr. Sarah Cox, who looks who looked at ESOL teachers um, grappling with the languages, learning the languages of the the students, the refugees, the migrants, um, which showed to have an increasing help on both sides in understanding mutual understanding and overcoming some, a number of challenges. Um, so I think this is a very interesting area, which obviously works against uh, the ideology of one language, one nation, honoring both host and guest language, languages equitably. Um, an interesting point is to note that 
this mindset to a certain extent is uh, behind um, a lot of the new curriculum for Wales area of learning ex experience, namely on languages, literacy and communication. Um, it hasn't been fully implemented yet, uh, but the idea is really to treat languages on a continuum. Um, but I think there could be more areas to explore here, looking at the idea of hospitality. How do you do this? And I think um, there needs to be more of an understanding of many of the barriers that migrants experience as part of this structure and support and intervention from the host community to enable to them to share languages in this equitable uh, way. Um, the result might be different without this structure in place. I'm just reminded of a quick example I came across a few days ago, which I think is particularly interesting considering Wales and how the education system is different and varied. Um, and there are different options uh, that migrants may not be aware of or may not have the information to. Um, this uh, example concerns uh, Syrian, two Syrian families who met together around the table before COVID. Um, when I have both had um, children, we're both learning Welsh, but in different me education mediums. One in Cardigan in a Welsh medium school and one in Aberystwyth in an English medium school, but didn't really realise um, that, well, it's certainly in the case of the Aberystwyth Syrian family, they were automatically referred to English medium education for their kids. And when they saw how fluent the other family in Cardigan, so the kids were speaking Welsh so fluently, they, they asked many questions. Why is this? Why don't my, my children <laughs> speak Welsh like this? Um, and I think it was a moment of realization for many of the people there that there are many uh, decisions which are taken for granted regarding uh, migrants. Uh, and it's something I would like to explore more. Looking now, I'm aware of time <laughs> slipping away. The adult language provision in Wales, which also is separate has been separate concerning language. ESOL on one side and Welsh for adults on the other. Uh, ESOL typically being very much a monolingual uh, system um, and the other languages of, of the students not really taking as a resource in the classroom. There's other people who have researched more on this, but also the Welsh language provision uh, aims at a very different uh, group or groups of people. Um, and also traditionally focused just on teaching through, through Welsh. Um, and just to say they are both, to today, two different provisions on the whole targeting different groups. But I wanna comment on some initiatives, which I think are worth noting that have been developing over the course of the last year, namely with the Welsh for adults sector that have de de developed a specific uh, Welsh course for targeting speakers from outside learners from outside the UK uh, and offered in most cases uh, free of charge. Um, and I know there's many that have taken this on board. And one example is a venture to develop USOL classes by Adult Learning Wales, which is also part of a European funded integration project for migrants. And although this uh, is, at a, is at its early stages of development, from discussions with the ESOL tutors teaching Welsh there, um, they, there is surprising that the Welsh class offers a platform to discuss language, to share multilingual trajectories, to negotiate belongings, and also provide something different, which has been called a release from some of the confinements of learning English um, and the requirements on them, whether it be for citizenship or for some form of examination. Um, I think this is an interesting uh, venture, which I hope will increase and develop in the future. Another notable initiative is from the Red Cross in Wales with the refugee women in, uh, in Newport. And I'm thinking, I'm, I have a little video here from the organizer, <laughs> Teresa. Um, I might not have time to, um, to watch now, but if anybody is interested, well, I'm happy to show it to you later. Uh, but who we'll comments here on, uh, the great take up amongst these women and how they have found it beneficial uh, for their lives, for their children. And even despite COVID, um, with all the complications, a core number have continued even so 
Uh, and many of these also are part of other projects um, associated with uh, Mental Health Wales. Um, and I think there is an interesting link here. I discussed this in a meeting yesterday. Um, that language, apart from English, can, can help, can enrich, can empower, and therefore, in a time of increased um, anxiety and confinement due to COVID, it can, it can empower, it can help people with their mental health. Uh, so I will skip that. Um, so I do think there's a lot more potential in Wales in terms of hospitality, in terms of welcome. I have noted in the past um, that there needs to be a more clear position from the Welsh Government on the Welsh language to newcomers uh, rather than being in passing or integrated into an ESOL policy. Um, but then I think more to myself, it's not really just about language. It's not just about Welsh language. It goes far and beyond. Um, and perhaps the idea of citizenship is really what we want to be thinking about and how all these elements are integrated into it, what it means to be hospitable or to implement linguistic hospitality and to improve well-being on both sides. Yet what I do see at the moment is really uh, the need for statistical data, for evidence, um, which are seemingly is not available. And rather, more recently, we see comments uh, still that really language skills other than English are not in demand. Um, there's limited evidence for it. Um, and it's not surprising. Uh, we're working with a very different um, mentality here, uh, at which, as I've commented previously, uh, the top-down ideologies are, are very much working against this idea of hospitality, of multilingualism, um, and it, it needs a different approach, a, a different, and also the idea is not measuring the demand, but also, you could say, creating the demand, which, which what has these initiatives have been part of doing. Uh, I mean, I do think these findings do contrast with other projects that I've been part of, such as in a European project, looking at migrants' access and provision of language in healthcare. Um, and um, so surveys carried out with over 100 participants in each case um, look favorably uh, in the case of Wales more than the other context, the bar, the, the Basque context, and um, seeing the benefit of learning, uh, learning Welsh. Um, so I, I think part of the research that I find the most interesting is being able to work alongside people um, as I mentioned, I did some action research um, where I was able to um, change preconceived ideas. Uh, in this case, namely ESOL tutors um, who are part of this uh, venture and whose attitudes as a result were, were changed and they, they realized um, you know, that, that migrants don't necessarily have, um, can you say the, um, well, I don't know, cultural linguistic baggage but also they have a different mindset, a different viewpoint. Uh, this is something also I've noted in many examples in my own research. Uh, I've categorized this here into challenging, owning and participating, but how, how the Welsh language can open doors in one case to feeling at home uh, or just to a feeling of empowerment um, and showing others that they don't necessarily have the same mindset. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the area of citizenship, as, as one uh, participant noted, learning Welsh was for this person part of being a citizen in Wales, interestingly not connected to national citizenship. Um, so I think there is a need for redefining citizenship, despite its national state confines uh, in the sense of visa, uh, of having a passport and spending thousands of pounds, ultimately having its own constraints, but really looking at it in its original form, which goes far beyond that, but it's all about being able to participate fully. Um, but all off, off, as the quote notes here, the, the implications of this phrase depends on lots of the conditions, the policies, the pedagogic engagement that create or do not create equitable conditions. So just to close then, some points on there's many things I could say in this wide ranging <laughs> presentation. Um, from my research standpoint, I, I do believe 
in looking at building a future of multicultural or intercultural or multilingual, whatever you want to call it, Welsh citizenship, uh, there is a need to look further at how Welsh and new speakers of Welsh and other languages can contribute to widening our understanding of citizenships, cohesion, well-being. Um, and there is possibility, there are possibilities from the bottom up. In some cases, there are many great examples taking place. I know University of South Wales are befriending schemes that have started up. Also, in terms of education, universities are taking ownership and creating possibilities, for example, for asylum seekers to, to have scholarships. But I would say these are, these are small beginnings, they are great, but there needs to be more of an infrastructure to build this, um, more schemes, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in the idea of befriending schemes at the moment between locals and migrants. But maybe also there needs to be a more uh, holistic policy from the Welsh Government. I don't know whether integration is the word that needs to be used. Certainly there is a new Scots integration strategy for all migrants, not just refugees and asylum seekers. Um, but there needs to be something, maybe even a, a policy on citizenship which caters for all citizens, whether they be established citizenship or new citizenship. Um, so those are some of my comments. Um, I hope has been helpful for, for the people here. Uh, and I think I've just about kept within my time. Um, so thank you very much. And I think there might be a short time for questions and comments. Oh, uh, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I enjoyed the video especially, and I do hope uh, that will be made available somehow, which seems like something that I'd really like to share in my lectures with students, for example. So um, well done for working on that. Uh, for those who arrived later later in the talk, Kroiso, welcome. Um, my name is Angharad and I'm chairing this uh, lecture by Dr. Gwenan Higgum. And indeed, we do have um, up to about quarter past 12 now for questions. Um, I should note also that this is a launch event for Amchwil Mido Cymru, Migration Research Wales, a network that Rhys David Jones and Catherine Edwards from Aberystwyth University have launched. Um, and if you're interested in these debates in general at all, please get in touch with Rhys David Jones, either by private chat or um, by email. Um, maybe Rhys, you can put your email address in the chat. Um, get in touch with him and you can register to be kept in touch. So if there are questions, uh, would you mind trying to use the hands up function, which is uh, in the reactions button at the bottom of the screen? If you're familiar with that, there's a way of kind of having a digital hand up. Or if not, just note in the chat that you want to ask a question and uh, I'll invite you to speak. Maybe that you just have a point or an experience you want to share and just add to the debate as well, you know. Maybe as people are, are gathering their thoughts, um, do you mind if I ask you, um, some questions, Gwenan. I have a ton of questions actually, but you know, I was really interested in how your research and your interviews um, suggest the ways in which language is thought about in government, in the Welsh government. And this may have changed over time. I think the impl your implication was it's changing over time. But it just struck me that language is thought of as a burden or as a challenge or as a difficulty. And that's such an interesting way of thinking about language, isn't it? And even when it's spun differently, it is a benefit for the workplace or a skill. Um, but there are also all sorts of affective ways of thinking about language, you know, as a place where we dwell or place where we connect with others or as something that brings joy or pleasure. Uh, I just wondered about kind of, whether you were interested maybe in developing those other ideas about what language is 
because uh, it just seemed that you were coming across just really Im impoverished ways of thinking about language generally compared to how your uh, some of the speakers in that video were talking about language as well. Yeah, no, it's totally right. Um, I guess, you know, as you, as your research goes on, you do change and things uh, take you in different areas. And um, I think, I, yeah, as you probably articulated better than me, uh, I am more interested in this effective um, powers of, la of language. And I think as well, maybe I touched on it, um, the way that English is being portrayed is very much uh, linked to pressure um, and to certain qualifications and it, it is being portrayed as a challenge and I think it is becoming a burden <laughs> for many uh, which is why it's interesting that the possibility of learning Welsh and, and other languages um, can challenge this thought uh, and it, it links also to the different narratives on belonging and migration in, in, in the UK in the Welsh context um, but yeah of course what I I'd like to see this developing more in local initiatives. Um, but as I mentioned, or as you mentioned, that this would also be transferred more and more into, into policies, um, you know, the positive and empowering effects of language, um, you know, not just as a means to get a, a job or to pass an IELTS test or to get citizenship, which, uh, which, you know, research shows it really is having an effect on people's minds and and realizing even when they do pass these tests, they're not necessarily accepted <laughs> as part of society. You know, um, so it, you know, obviously there's the, the confinements of what language can do in, in to some extent there as well. So I think it's really interesting. I'd like to to look more into that. Oh, hello, Mike. Check is that right? I hope so. Hello. I've been using <laughs> um, yeah, I want to say Dioshmar Yaun, thanks for that ever so much, Gwen. And I really, really enjoyed uh, listening to, to your thoughts. Um I, like Angara, I, I have quite a few questions, but I'll, I'll stick to one, I, I guess. Um you mentioned that uh, you were quite skeptical about the nation of sanctuary ambition by the Welsh government initially and you didn't go on to explain how you feel about it now so much perhaps I wasn't clever enough to read between the lines um but uh I'd like to hear what you feel uh is, is what's possible for it now especially in light of um Pretty Patel's you know pretty evil um nationality and borders plan or bill, sorry, um, you know, what can the Welsh government do with regards to these new um, policy changes by the, the UK Westminster government? Uh, and how do you feel that may affect the, the, the nation of sanctuary ambition? There's a question in there somewhere. Yes. Um, yeah, I, 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 my feelings, first of all, have have changed and I think um, I mean I think my skepticism was maybe when it was launched and I, I think it's a few years have passed and I there are certain great things that have been developing including <laughs> as I mentioned a lot of the things that um, that have been happening with the University of South Wales with these sanctuary scholarships and I know the Welsh government supports that um, and yeah, it's a hard one to, to say exactly because um, still to somewhat extent carrying the burden <laughs> or the, the, the shadow that hostile environment policy casts on you. Um, yeah, ultimately it is limited and, um, you know, what really matters is the decisions, these asylum <laughs> decisions that have a great impact. Um, but I think more and more I'm seeing that the power of people and the community and I think whether it's due to COVID as well and, and, and that feeling that has been exposed that the people coming together um, as well as maybe more, more awareness of the UK context and the revealing of a lot of the injustices that have been taking place. Um, 
that people are coming together and I've, I've seen and, and witnessed different things either supported directly by the Welsh Government or, or not and it makes me realise that there is, there's a lot of possibility and, and it's not just uh, yeah it, it's not just dependent on what one when, when declaration statement will say uh, and it's but the, as I outlined I think there yeah there, there needs to be more of this I guess on the larger scale and that it, it is built into some sort of infrastructure which is not just pockets here and there um, and it's all tied in and I think there are uh, tendencies for things to be scattered for there to be a lack of uh, information communication and you know I, I guess governments the way things are going is is <laughs> uh, they hand the, the um, yeah, the power to the people is, which is good, but I think as well that there is more responsibility on them to really um, create this clearer strategy in in the finer details um, of what is possible into well, the education community uh, and 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 to yeah to do that. I, I hope that kind of answers the question. Yes, yeah, sort of. Sort of as I was asking it, I realised myself this is this far too broad a question to have a, a satisfactory, clear answer. Sorry for asking it in, in that respect. But the other thing I'd like to mention, if I can, is that okay, Anhalid? Can I ask one more thing? Uh, yes, yes, and uh, quickly, and then we have a question from Ian Jones in the chat, when and if you want to read that and carry on. It, yeah, it's just. Oh, thank you. It's just that. Um, you mentioned the um, sense of belonging and social connections um, and power. And I, I think language classes do an awful lot more than, than, than people realise in, in bringing people together, in helping people make connections. And, the, and you mentioned um, that you know, traditional ESOL classes are, are pressured by um, giving people a sense that they have to pass assessments and examinations, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And if we could somehow um, uh, uh, increase the number of Welsh and or English language classes. I think that can play a really important role, both linguistically, but also socially and with regards to, to integration. So, you know, absolutely, I think that's the right, the right track to go along. So um, thanks for raising it. Oh, thank you for that. That's really useful. So there's a question from you, Ian Jones. Hi there. Um, and you were interested in Gwenan's closing thoughts about citizenship and whether there's a space for working towards a notion of performative citizenship in the Welsh context. Um, maybe you can talk a little about multiculturalism there, Gwenan, too, if it's connected, because I think you mentioned at some point in a possibility of developing a Welsh version of what that might mean rather than just take something off the shelf um, that's been thought through in different in a different context. Yeah, oh, I mean, there's there's lots of different layers and different ways of of addressing the question. I mean, you mentioned Karad. I think, in terms of the the understanding, even in academia, um, there has been a lack of really uh, defining. Um, these citizenship multiculturalism from the Welsh perspective. So I think there's a lot more work to be done that to get that those ideas talked about amongst academics. Um, I don't attempt to really know how to define it, but it's part of a process. And I think that's the point, it's, it's changing. And I think people, different groups being part of the idea of citizenship can expand, change, challenge. Um, and in terms of, um, citizenship in practice um, my research was well piloted citizenship classes what I called them and it was really language class ultimately um, but I realized it was more it's all about taking all histories and contexts all together negotiating challenging and I realized I was actually challenging a lot of my own preconceived ideas and and I think that's what it should be about you know and it's that exchange and getting people together um, so I do think it can work on that level. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't know, I'm, I, I see it on a community level, on a policy level, and even what's happening in academia, uh, it, it just needs to be out there. And I think if you look at a lot of the literature, there's like tendencies to look to the um, Anglo-centric 
resources. Uh, whereas, you know, looking at uh, the Welsh case, the Welsh resources, the background history, as well as all other people's contribution to it, uh, to change, challenge, to make something new and uh, from, from what we already have and something hopefully positive. It's quite vague, but I hope that answers something. <laughs> Are there any more um, questions or comments? Um, oh, I see that there's a nice point here from Amy uh, Sanders in the chat. Um, I was fascinated, especially when you started talking about how you have been reflective on colonialism and colonialization and how this impacts on your perspective. Yes, I'm sure this is, has been part of many people's experiences over the past 18 months with the extraordinary energy of the Black Lives Matter movement at, at this time last year. Um, do you want to say anything further about that, Gwen uh, Yes, I can say something. It's very much, as I said, uh, you know, a learning process. Um, I think I've always identified myself as a member of a minority group. <laughs> And I, it's still true, but I, I think having been exposed uh, through um, experiences of migrants, uh, as well as I think just the, yeah, as I mentioned, just the Black Lives Matter and then the literature I've, I've read on decolonization, uh, it's more a realizing of <laughs> unconscious privileges that I've had, uh, whether that be, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've um, seen it in reality in some cases, um, uh, and things I just took it for granted. And, and I think it's so important as a researcher to really think about this and, and realize actually yeah, I have taken um, yeah, my, my identity for granted that I have so many privileges uh, and just acknowledging that and thinking what the impact that is, even on the people I interview. And I even realized that these people, uh, what they tell me uh, it might be changed because they see me suddenly in a position of power and a person who um, yeah has more options and more possibilities and has power even to manipulate what they say and I, I just um, yeah thinking about how, what kind of methodologies would help my research really uh, in the future um, to improve on this and to take to take these things into consideration. Are there any further um, questions or contributions anyone would like to make? I have been uh, working the past few weeks actually on reviewing a special issue of the journal Citizenship Studies, uh, which is going to be on citizenship and language. Uh, it's being edited by Eva Pumala and Reiko Shindo. And through that collection of articles, which I presume will come out towards the end of this year, next year, you know, I've been struck by many of the themes you're talking about, Gwen, and are taking place, you know, in Sweden, in the Netherlands. So these are lively issues across Europe, you know, not just relevant for Wales. And all of those are similarly saying that kind of Anglo-centric model doesn't translate or that the, um, that the situation is more complicated on the ground elsewhere. Um, and it was, yeah, it's a really interesting collection and um, I encourage you to look out for it to everyone when it, when it comes out, special issue of citizenship studies on um, me, looking at many cases of these kind of citizenship language classes and so on that are often made obligatory for migrants with varying experiences in those classes. Okay. Um, I can't see any more contributions, but you've had lots of lovely comments in the chat, Gwenan, about how much people have appreciated the talk. Um, and thank you to you for preparing um, oh, such a contribution on and to Rhys and Catherine for organizing. I see there's just one more question coming. 
Um, I was wondering if you could say more about Welsh citizenship, multiculturalism, in relation to racialized peoples born in the UK, including in Wales, so not technically migrants. Yes, so this very issue of how people who are citizens are treated as second class citizens, perhaps, or not treated um, with equity um, in terms of Welsh citizenship. That's a good question. Gwenland, do you have anything to, uh, to say about this new question that's come in? Uh, yeah, well, I would firstly say that um, it hasn't been a focus of my research, but I'm very aware, uh, increasingly aware of uh, commonalities and differences between different experiences of people born in Wales and being subject to uh, discrimination. Um, I, I don't really have anything particular to say, just that, uh, yeah. I, it, they, it needs to be uh, <laughs> well. They need to be part of the discussion, and I think other people uh, who specialize on this would be able to comment um, more. Uh, I am aware of increasing uh, ident you know, identi um, what have you, as you've called mentioned racialized people identifying with Welshness and Britishness and some of the complications that 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 may come with that. Um, yeah, but just to say that, yeah, well, you know, that we need to have this discussion in an inclusive way and I hope there will be more opportunities to, to collaborate with the likes of yourselves. I'm aware <laughs> doing great research. Um, and, and, but also for, yeah, it's very easy to work in, in silos and groups. Um, and yeah, that we should just be collaborating together. Mm. I noticed some great projects on Windrush experiences of people in Wales. I thought that was those that work is really valuable. There were some projects around South Wales of um, Windrush citizens who settled in Wales. Um, I thought that's such a great resource for the classroom, for example. Um, you know. Um, at university level and, and school level. Um, did I see your hand up there, Laura? Can you hear me? Laura, would you like to ask something? I can't hear you, but um, oh, you're well, that's fine. I'm used to this from teaching. <laughs> Would you like to write something in the chat if your mic is not working? I'll just give you a minute. Um, I know there's a further comment thing from Amy here. Oh, do you want to respond yeah. to that? Uh, so, yeah, I, so I think it's re re relative to the previous question on colonization. Um, and that's, yeah, I, uh, I know it's a very, uh, I think there's a lot more attention than, it needs to be addressed towards colonization and uh, what's not discussed in, in a wider context and in particular case of Wales and also the Welsh language. And there is increasing thought and, 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 and expressions of the fact that Welsh language is no different to English language um, and that they were part of the colonial project the people uh, and that is true um i think i would i would refer you to the work <laughs> slightly controversial of simon brooks and I, and I think the point there is um there's needs the the key thing is there's a need to to, to look at sources available in wales and not to not to 
um, take the discussion from the ang Anglo-centric point of view and place it in Wales and just to think about these issues, think about the Welsh language, which as, as far as I can see, it doesn't, it's not a clear black and white issue. Um, but um, yeah, it just so, needs to be discussed. Is that, is that want, yeah, Laura has added her question too, if you don't mind me coming in, sorry. Um, just to a, a point that it's important to ensure that Welshness isn't equated with whiteness intentionally or unintentionally, being careful not to exclude people and make them feel other when discussing these topics. Um, this is something that was, was discussed and aired last summer, um, I felt, in really useful ways. I remember a great podcast by Sarah and Jones on ideas about whiteness and Welshness. Um, and, but of course, in the British context, that's been aired for much longer, such as in the Biko Parek report. When, is it in that report when they say, you know, whiteness and Britishness go together like Yorkshire pudding and a roast beef dinner or something? And, you know, how do we just prize that apart and, um, and question it? Um, and the, but these, I do think these topics have not, have not been aired as much in Wales. And this is just a really urgent issue, isn't it? Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, yeah, and, and I think the work and myself, others are involved with is, is yeah, trying to show, uh, I mean, I think my focus on language is to show that it's, and it's not, it's not directed to race. It, anybody can learn the language and uh, the benefits of new speakers of all backgrounds in the Welsh speaking community is very much needed and hopefully welcomed. Um, and yeah, so I, I agree completely. And I'm sure others will have much more uh, meaningful comments regarding this, but I think it's very, very relevant. That can lead those who aren't white and don't speak Welsh feeling othered if the discussions aren't done with care. Yes. Thank you for that comment, uh, Laura, and for um, writing it in the chat. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Um, so we have reached the end of our time, even though, but I do note there's an, another contribution from Teresa here. What would you like me to do, Rhys? Um, would you like to carry on or, or have you got another? Well, we've got uh, okay. time allocated until a half past. So, um, okay, well, please. We'll have the time to stick you, around. You, you can leave Zoom if you have to go. So, <laughs> but for those of us who can stay, Teresa, have you got a microphone? Do you want to speak? Hi, yes. Um, so with regards to what, um, well, actually, first of all, Gwen, and thank you very much for uh, highlighting um, multilingualism, how important that is, multilingualism in Welsh, and how it's important for refugees and asylum seekers to be given that um, platform um, to learn Welsh as well. With regards to what La um, Laura, sorry, um, what um, I can't remember, actually. Um, anyways, the chat in the conversation, Laura just mentioned that um, there is a danger of other, if we're looking at Welsh as a white language and we're encouraging refugees and asylum seekers to speak it, then that will make those who are not um, white and not speaking Welsh being seen as others. And I totally agree with you, Laura, because that's one of the things that I've been working towards uh, for uh, many years. Um, with Dusky Cambrai Gwent, we've had conversations where um, if we're to encourage people to learn Welsh who are not white, we need to make sure that we go into communities. We're not just going to raise that awareness amongst refugees and asylum seekers. We've got to raise that awareness amongst BAME people who are born and live in Wales as well. And they should also be give, given the opportunity to learn Welsh. And in many cases, when you have been, um, like in my case, learning Welsh for many years and gone into lots of different uh, classes in Cardiff, in, in uh, Newport, 
I very rarely come across anybody who is non-white learning Welsh. And to me, that speaks volumes. Uh, the black community, well, whether it's just black uh, or BAME, is not aware of the Welsh language. Uh, they are not even in many cases aware that um, yeah, the classes are available, where, where to go if you want to learn the language. And to many people, they still view Welsh medium schools as being for white Welsh speakers. Can and I just can I just add something there, Teresa? I've managed yeah. to fix my microphone. I think it's um, even when people are aware, they those spaces feel very white. Um, Absolutely. And I speak from personal experience here. Um, even venturing and tipping a toe into them, you may, you can be the benevolence can be very uh, othering in itself, mm. um, and it is unusual for. Uh, black people and other people from other ethnic minority uh, backgrounds to want to feel sure that they have people of the same skin colour or, or same background around them to want their children not to be the only black child in the class um, and that in itself is off-putting um, it, it, it really is that even when people are aware um, there is that and it becomes a self-perpetuating problem, of course. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you too. I mean, with schools, it's, um, it's an infrastructure problem there, isn't it? You know, where um, the school system is set up in that way, where the languages are separated. Um, I feel it's a really tough call to ask how to, how to, promote more mixture in that context. Um, and in just my, my small neighborhood here in Swansea, the only way I can think of trying to break down some of those barriers is that the schools do more together, you know, rather than the school has its events and so this school has its events, um, but the kids don't really meet apart from in the park. Um, I just wonder if there are more possibilities there for Welsh-speaking schools and non-Welsh-speaking schools, as well as all sorts of other schools, such as there's a Polish school that meets on, on Saturdays in Swansea. You know, how do these kind of collaborate around events or um, campaigns or whatever it is? I mean, this is just these are just personal questions here. This is not something I work on or um yeah, no, it's, it's totally true um obviously i focus more on migrants but if i just there's so much work to do there from uh, thinking of welsh medium education sector it's fine to desire people <laughs> but do they have do they do they have the awareness um resources every to, to cater for all of these different things that I, I there is one example in cardiff view town where i live a school hammer dryad they've made a direct effort to target minority ethnic communities. I know a third of their pupils now uh, are from that background. Um, but then, yeah, I, I go to around in the park and, and people still comment about, uh, you know, the Welsh, the English school being really just white and the Mount Stewart school is the, you know, the place where the other communities go to. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, it needs to be addressed in so, in so many, levels and I would just like to work more in that area in the future. Too big for us to cover today, <laughs> really. Thank you for the contributions though. Um, is there more that you wanted to add, Teresa? Um, gosh, I think it's, it's a topic that can go on and on and on, but I do think that there is a huge um, is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. Mm. Um, and, you know, Esco Hamadriad is great that there's a school there uh, in Cardiff Bay, which is very multicultural. Mm. And we're seeing more children who are non-white going into those schools, um, into, into that school. Um, and we're hoping in Newport, in Peel, which is also a very multicultural area, that, you know, there'll be a Welsh medium school 
And with that Welsh Medium School coming there, hopefully children from multi-ethnic communities, uh, parents will be made aware of that school. Uh, they will be encouraged to send their children to those schools. They will be given um, the positiveness of uh, ha having a Welsh language. Yeah, it's those are kind the kind of things that I've been focusing on uh, at the Red Cross with the women uh, to say to them, you know, you know, Welsh is a living language, uh, and if you actually learn Welsh, you know, you are bilingual already. You'll be mon you'll be you know, you'll be multilingual. Uh, it'll open doors for you. You'll have uh, more pathways uh, when you start looking for work. And it's it's a positive thing to have instead of people feeling, well, okay, there's, a, there's another Welsh school, but we won't send our children to it. I'm hoping that when the school in Newport finally comes, we will see through some of the work that we've been doing um, an interest in mm. people who have been made aware um, and have been given information so they can make in, you know, their own choices to do that. Mm. It's such an opportunity there when you're starting something from scratch, isn't it? To design it and to set principles and an image and a vision, vision from the start. Uh, I think the challenge of working with schools and infrastructures that are already there and histories that are already there. So that's a different kind of work that also needs to be done. Um, but like you say, these are big topics. Um, um, but I, I'm hope that, you know, when with this network, there'll be more opportunities to keep going with these topics and think about, um, learn about work that different people are doing. Um, and also share ideas about new projects and initiatives. Um, so can I very quickly ask, yeah. and you can answer me separately, um, just what's the plan for the network to work with the existing networks that have Can I pass you to um, Rhys? So I'll close this lecture event and I'll pass to Rhys, who is one of the um, co-organisers of the network, so he can say more. Yeah, um, yeah, so um, we are planning to work with existing uh, networks in um, and research centres in other universities. We don't want to sort of duplicate uh, any work. It's a, it's a matter of linking in together. Um, if you want to perhaps have, uh, drop me an email, I'm very happy to discuss that. I'm just conscious of, of time. Yeah, uh, yeah that's that, perfect. If you want to drop me an email, I'm very happy to have a chat um, about you know what kind of collaborations and things, but we don't want to certainly avoid, avoid uh, duplication. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll sign out now, but thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for the great um, talk, Gwen, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Ta-da, Hoyle.